But John is a character that I've really enjoyed, and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, character that has a massive impact in the early church. Let's say this together, that way we can um, hear ourselves speak this. So let's just say this together. I have made your name known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. Father God, help us to hear these words. Help us to, to live out these words and to understand what John is writing, the importance of making your name known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's interesting to sit back and think, okay, if you were in that situation and, and you had the, the ability to be God, what would you tell John to write? What's, what's this importance? What, what is there? And I want us to jump back to where John grows up. It's just a, it's a very small town. They found it, El Araj, just on the north um, east corner of, of the Sea of Galilee, a very small fishing village, probably population 200, 300 at most. Very small, similar, similar to Summerville. Summerville. But, but in this village, there are five young kids, five of them. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, all in this very, very small... This would be like five people coming out of Summitville and changing the world. They grew up together. Imagine this young boy running around this small village, all Jewish, all very, very religious, coming in and out of the synagogue, playing with his playmates, joining his father Zebedee out in the fishing boats, probably very, very young, probably eight, nine, ten years old. He is now hearing, him and his brother, hear about this wild man dressed in camel hair, standing along the banks of the Jordan, yelling, yelling, in the desert, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So John and his brother grab some fish and a little bit of lunch and, and go hear him. And at the very first word, John is in. There is something about this Yochanan this John the baptizer, this, this man that just intrigues him. And they follow. They begin to interact with, with John. But then one day, John is, is teaching and he says, Behold, the Messiah. And John hears Christ call for him to follow. Years he walked with him, sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning from him. There at the Last Supper, leaning against Christ's chest. May have been the one that, that turns and runs in the garden. Only disciple that we know of that's at the foot of the cross. Watching his master, his Messiah, his rabbi die. Being told to take care of Mary, his mother. The responsibility that of, of, a, of a teenager or, or a young person, he sees Christ die. Hears about Christ's resurrection and, and is the fastest one to the tomb. Leaves Peter in the dust. Sees and hears this resurrected Christ. Sees Christ ascend to heaven. Begins working with Peter, one of the main characters in Acts. Working together with this early church and the disciples just trying to get to grips and put a foundation under this new structure, this new concept of, of followers, followers of the way. These people following the Messiah. His fellow disciples begin to die. One after another. Before long, he's the last one. The early church now moves from... What's modern day Syria over to Ephesus along Asia Minor, Turkey today. And John's there. He moves Mary, Christ's mother, Mary, takes her with him and moves her into Ephesus. Begins to oversee this early church, rotating through the churches in and, and Ephesus and then, then Smyrna and Pergamum and, and Thyatira and Philadelphia and Sardis and Laodicea, constantly going around this. It's the mail route of the Roman, Roman system in Asia Minor, but you can see him traveling and working with these people and, and trying to get this church up and going and then trying to get this people and sitting around their table and talking through the, the theological framework of what Christ has told him, telling these stories about Christ calling me and seeing him and, and feeding the 5,000, and, and then raising... He's constantly working with this early church for years, decades, decades, working as the overseer of the early church. 
He knows these people by name. He knows them. It's not just some acquaintance. He knows these people. He has worked with these people for years. He's witnessed fellow Christians being martyred. The rise of Nero, the Roman Empire taking over, trying to come to grips with it. And and he has put such pressure in the Roman world that he's exiled to Patmos. It's interesting, history is a little vague on Patmos being a place of exile. The other islands are mentioned, but Patmos is not. So we don't know if he just moved there to be hidden or was persecuted in a way and told to go stay there. Because Patmos is actually a very beautiful place with villas. So we're not sure why or how he's there. For about three years, he's exiled. We don't know how old. Church history says in his 90s, I would lean further late 70s or late 60s, early 70s. But he's old. His, his job is almost over. I think he is thinking that it probably is over. But now he's sitting here, <clears throat> sitting on this island, trying to reminisce. To me, you're three years in exile. Is he breaking out his old photo books? Remembering. The older we get, the more you begin to remember unique details of the past. They come out of you from nowhere. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Is he, is he there trying to understand what's happening? Trying to wrestle and think about and pray for this church? But one day as he's there, he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard a voice behind me, a loud voice like a trumpet. I want us in our minds to imagine this. All of your life you have poured out for the name of Jesus. You are the last man standing. Your time is coming to an end and you know it. And then in exile, one day, either you are transported to the divine or in a dream you go to the divine realm and you hear a voice behind you. sounds familiar, but it's different. There's there's something different about this voice. It sounds like your friend. You almost forgot what it sounded like because it's been so long, but, but there's something unique about this voice, and you turn, and it says his face was shining like the sun, eyes on fire, feet like burnished bronze, dressed fully in white, his hair white as snow, and it says you fall as if dead. Imagine, but on your shoulder, you feel something. You you felt that before. You remember an arm reaching around you at the Last Supper. You remember that hand on your shoulder as you walked with him along the way, and He says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and and look, I am alive. Now you can just feel the joy, homecoming at last. Now this is not in the text, but imagine the hug. Imagine the tears that are happening. You have made it. You finally, the one that you have lived for all your life, the one that all of your friends, all the disciples have now been martyred for except you, and you have arrived. I see John going, where are the boys? Where's Mary that I've, 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 I've supported and, and kept? Where, where's everybody at? Where, where's everybody? Each one of us has met the Messiah. Each one of us hopefully have heard his voice call your name and say, child, follow me. Most of us have walked with him for years. We've sat at his feet. We've learned from him. We've we've tried to follow in in his footsteps. We've tried to to work with other believers and, and take the name of Jesus and the fellowship that is there. Imagine that day when you step on that shore. 
Imagine that day when you hear that voice behind you and go, wait, I've heard that voice before. I've heard it before. It sounds different, a little bit. Something's clearer. And then you fall. And you fill the arm, the hand on your shoulder. I don't know what John was thinking. I would want to stay. I... I wouldn't want to leave his presence. The boys are back together. The gang has the chance to sit around and eat and fellowship and and go back to what used to be the fun and fellowship that we used to have together, the circle being together. But he looks at him and says, I've got one final mission. One final thing that you have to do. I need you to make my name known. I need you to go back and tell again the stories. I don't know how you leave the divine to go back to the dirt. I I don't know how you leave the glory and go back to the pain. From breathing the breath of life to breathing in reality. But there's one final mission. Each one of us has one final mission. For John, he had to make another return, another route around the churches. I need you to go back. You know these, you've been there for years and years. I need you to go back and give them one final word. I I, I just have to have you go back and talk about it. I need you to write this down and make sure they understand. Write it down. I need you to write down the testimony. I need need you to write down what this church is and the testimony and what you see in these places. Imagine Christ telling you, I, I need you to write it down. Your message. Your testimony. I need you to make one more lap around the places that you know. The people that you've been involved with. The places that you grew up in and, and been a part of. I need you to make one more turn around it and tell them your testimony. And he does. He gets to Ephesus, his hometown, his home church, his home group. And it says that I know your deeds. I know your deeds. When I see John beginning to write this, I see tears rolling down his eyes and down his cheeks. Here's Christ say, tell them I know your deeds. And I see John going, yeah, I know them too. Ephesus, my home. Pay attention. I see your hard work, your your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people. I know that you're black and white. I know that you have to have things written down in stone. I know this, but you've left your first love. And John's going, yeah, I know that. Smyrna. I see that you've been afflicted. I know what the regulations that the Roman Empire has put on you, that you can't buy or sell it in the, in the market. I understand that. Yet you are rich. You're in poverty, but you're so rich. I need you to go to the suffering ones. I need you to go to those around you that are suffering. The ones that are poor. The ones that have had a hard life. You know them. doesn't matter what happens. It seems like they always get the wrong end of the deal. They're either sick, the company changes, they lose their job, illness happens, it doesn't matter. Some people have just had a life of suffering. I need you to go to them and give them your testimony. Pergamum, I, you live where Satan lives. I could take you there. There are so many temples throughout Pergamum that it, it just blows your mind. That's where Satan lives. I need you to go, those that are in the evil parts of the world, those that are having to deal with things that are evil on a daily basis. You want to talk about police officers and nurses and people down in the dirt having to deal with depravity. I need you to go to them. I know that they haven't given up my name yet. Even though there's been people murdered and martyred in your town, you have not forsaken. I need you to go to them. Each one of us knows who that is. Thyatira. 
I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. There are people in our lives that are working overtime, especially in the ministry. They're out there working twice as hard. They may have started out on fire, and they're twice on fire now, and they are pouring it all out, and they are about done. I need you to go to them. Give me your testimony. Tell them what's going on. Tell them how God is working in your life. Sardis, you have a reputation of being alive. You used to be so alive, but something happened. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. You're dead. Go tell those that have have left the faith or are on the way out, going, wait a minute here. I have a testimony. Here is what God is doing today, right now. Philadelphia, I put an open door in front of you. No one can shut it, but you have so little strength. But you have kept my word. Philadelphia, earthquakes after earthquakes have demolished your town. Caesar has come in and taxed you beyond measure. You're now been persecuted and martyred. I know there's little strength here. I know you are about exhausted, but you have not denied my name. You've kept the mission. You've made my name known, Laodicea. I know your deeds. I've been there. I've worked with you. We've been a part of this. We've, we've, we've sat around dinner. I know your deeds. You're, you're agnostic. Yeah. You're not hot. You're not cold. I, I just wish you were one or the other. How many people in our life that you could just you wish you could grab them and say, can you get serious about something? You live the American dream. There's nothing that infects you, impact, impacts you. you. You live a life of ease. Are you going to get serious about anything? Your family's just walking away. You have no good relationships. The end is kind of, are, what are you going to do? And Christ tells John, write it down. Tell it. Make my name known. I've told this, I think, at least one other time. It's been a while. But it is my testimony. For many years, I mean, I grew up in a Bible college, literally from third grade on, I lived on a Bible college campus. Graduated from Bible college, poured myself into the ministry in a lot of ways. In my 30s, and you begin to see things a little differently, I realized something wasn't working. I wasn't sure what it was. Honestly, didn't. I was fortunate to do a trip to Israel, came back, and now on fire. But everything I was doing wasn't working. I would push and thought I was doing everything correct, but friction. It's relationships, it's church. It happens. And I felt like I should go to Israel and study. Worked for the children of Israel. They went to the desert. Christ went to the desert. I figured it might as well work for me too. Not really, but that's the thought. <laughs> and so my wife and I, on a pretty quick decision, I think it took us three months from talking about it to actually landing in Israel, so it was kind of quick. Um, we moved the entire family there. It was well thought out. Um, it's an amazing experience to, to live in Jerusalem. We were, right, we were right next to the West Bank and the parts of Jerusalem. So every day I was walking in and out of the West Bank and a part of Temple Mount, and like I could walk anywhere, and the Bible is just there. It doesn't matter what stone you stepped on it, it's in the Bible. It's, it's the weirdest feeling when you're, when you're walking this. And what was interesting about Israel is Israel is a very expensive country because everything has to be brought in by boat. So prices are through the roof. Our rent was over 3000 a month just for the rent. Food was almost double, no, more than that, almost triple of what it was in the U.S. You can't even buy a gallon of milk, but a half gallon of milk was almost $10. Very, very expensive. We were self-supporting. I had a list of pros and cons before I went. If this works, we can go. If this doesn't work, we can't go. And a lot of it had to do with around my job because I was going to go work full-time, go to college, raise a family, and travel. I know. 
looking back on it, that wasn't wise. But that's what God had, had provided. And for the first six months, everything is absolutely amazing. Beautiful country, we're traveling, getting into college, starting classes, everything is amazing. And I was finally given the opportunity to do what I had been wanting to do, and that was to lead my very first tour. Finally, everything's coming together. The sky is sunny. I get to lead people in the lands of the Bible and tell them about Jesus. Even better, I get to take them to Temple Mount and show them a place where God lived for a thousand years. It doesn't get better than this. It was gorgeous. The weather was perfect. The group was alive. I'm teaching. I'm just having the time of my life. I am now leading them past where the, the adulterous woman was, was met Christ, where the lady put in her two mites right entering into the temple. All these stories. And I'm standing about 15 feet from where the Holy of Holies would have been. And in my pocket, my phone buzzed. And I pulled it out. And there was a couple emails. And I'm just looking at the subject lines just because of what was going on. Change of direction. No longer needed. And every single one of my clients decided I was no longer needed. You want to talk about a punch to the gut. I thought this was what God wanted. I, I am literally standing 15 feet away from where God lived for a thousand years. And this, is this a sign? Is this what I'm not supposed to do? I've got my entire family. Do I fly home immediately? Flights are $1,500 a ticket. There's seven of us. Like, is this tomorrow I've got to be heading to the airport? Like, this can't go on. I've just lost all sources of income. We're self-supporting. There's no one else. I didn't feel like I should leave. So I do what all depressed people. I head to the side of my desert. I never could get clear. I, I didn't. I didn't feel like I should, I, I just had no direction at all. I was like, I don't feel like I should go home. I'm not sure if I should stay. For about two weeks, I was doing my best. Not sure. Nothing was there. I w Oddly, I received an email. How are you doing? I just recently switched jobs. And I would love for you to come in and talk with us. Can you be in Cincinnati on Monday? I think this was like midweek. And I'm like, I can do that. I, I, I red eye it, land late Sunday, barely sleep and walk in. And of course, God doesn't do this for everybody. It doesn't always work out this way. But the deal I signed was better than all the other clients I had before. God moves. It's not always this way. But I guarantee you that you have a story. You have something that you can tell that shows how God has worked in your life. At the very end of Christ's life, he's praying I find it very interesting what he says. He says, I have made your name known. The final of his prayer, it's not that I lived the perfect life, and he could have. It doesn't say that, oh, I was the son of God and I did everything that you told me. He's like, no, I made your name known. Why? So that the love that I have with you can be in other people as well. 
that this love can be spread. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to make his name known. It may end up on a martyr's cross. It did for all of them except one. But just imagine the hand on the shoulder that says, just fear not. Well done. Let's stand. God, we thank you so much that you've made a way for us. Help us now not to get comfortable, not to to avoid the difficult people around us, but to tell our testimony to those that we have worked with, to those that we have rubbed shoulders with, because ultimately it's nothing that we have done. It's nothing that I have done. I don't deserve anything. It's to make your name known so that at the end we can hear you say, well done, and get the gang back together and worship you around the cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.